It's a call that's telling me I'm here to serve. It's a need to make a difference in the world. 24 hours, day or night, these healing hands will make it right. Looking in their eyes, I know that I'm changing lives. Changing lives. Changing lives for the better. For the better. Changing lives. Hi again, everyone. Candace Kruger along with Jim Knox. We're back again with another edition of the Best Docs Network, featuring some of the best physicians in the Houston area that help change people's lives. And speaking of best, we'll kick off today's show with one of the best plastic surgeons in the Houston area. That is plastic surgeon, Dr. Lucian Rubella. I had two children and I nursed them both and my breasts were completely saggy and gone. Aisha came to me after she had two children. She was interested in improving the appearance of her breast after uh, breastfeeding and childbearing. They had lost some of the fullness and uh, that typically happens after uh, giving birth. I simply wanted to go back to the way I looked before I had children. I didn't want to look unnatural in any way, and he completely understood that, and he had a very good understanding of what both me and my husband wanted. That's the most common question, is can they get that body back after children? They may not necessarily get that exact body, but we certainly can remove the extra skin, tighten up their waist, and give them that figure back that they had before. Um, the procedure went very well, and the recovery time was Easier than I thought. I mean, I thought the tummy tuck, which I didn't, almost didn't want to do in the beginning, and I ended up doing, which I'm very happy with, was actually much easier than the breast augmentation. Um, I was probably in bed for about five days, and then not really back to myself for about two weeks, but four to six weeks after that, I was completely fine, completely fine, like nothing had happened. I felt great. Typically, after having children, women have extra skin, and some fat along their tummy as well as on their hips and this is even with all the exercising many people can't lose that weight and so if they've completed their childbearing that's the perfect candidate with the breast many times again there's postpartum involution of the breast so many times again after childbearing they can't reverse this effect and again that's a good candidate um, he was very very nice he was very um apical to my needs, um, you know, he talked to both to me and my husband about what kind of results I wanted. Someone who, like herself, who's very fit and uh, wanted to enhance the appearance of her breast after childbearing, this was a perfect case for her. And he was so professional and so nice, it was fantastic, fantastic experience. Tiku broke his jaw growing up and his teeth never lined up until he met oral surgeon Dr. Paul Metz. To find out more about Tiku's story and other life-changing stories, log on to BestDocsNetwork.com. The difference with the sleeve uh, compared to the gastric bypass is that there's no malabsorptive component to the surgery. It avoids some of the long-term issues that can happen with the gastric bypass. In particular, there are very few uh, vitamin and mineral deficiencies later because everything goes down the normal way. The gold standard operation, of course, is the gastric bypass. It's been around for 50 years. It has very predictable weight loss. What we're seeing is uh, patients who are a year out from surgery who've lost 60, 70, or 80 percent of their extra body weight. Well, I had what's called the Ruin Y, is where they make a small pouch um, out of the stomach and they divert part of the intestines so that I have a little bit of malabsorption. So I have to supplement my diet with uh, several vitamins that would otherwise not be absorbed through part of the intestines. Jean had gone and, and had a lap band operation done previously with another surgeon. And like some of the lap band patients, she, what she'd experienced was uh, a frustrating cycle of, of having the band adjusted to a certain tightness and 
getting some difficult symptoms from that, only to have it loosen to make those symptoms go away and then uh, losing a little bit of weight and then gaining it back. And she has lost somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, two-thirds of her extra body weight from the level she was at with the gastric bypass. Two-thirds of the weight has gone away. My friends comment that I have more pep in my step and I'm able to work more days in a row and longer hours and not feel fatigued. I looked at the breakdown for the last 12 months and it appears that about 74% of the patients are choosing the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. Most of the rest of the patients are choosing a gastric bypass and we're doing very few lap bands currently, mostly because the weight loss just isn't as predictable with the lap bands and there are some long-term issues. Go to the seminars, especially Dr. Marvin, who is very open explains things in a very simple way for everyone to understand. We have numerous support groups here in Houston and that has been my main success. Many of us live with pain, but you don't have to. Pam is here to help. Whether it's sports injuries, arthritis, or joint pain, the physicians of Pam are dedicated to your wellness and getting you back to pain-free days. So what are you waiting for? Go to PamaInc.net and find a physician or orthopedic specialist who can help you stop pain and live life to its fullest again. Pama. Pain freedom. Go to PamaInc.net. The symptoms is that I had headaches, a lot of congestion, infections in the throat, a lot of mucus in the back, uh, ear headaches, um, so much stuff going on. Denise Martinez is a patient who came to my office complaining of nasal obstruction, facial pressure, constant headache. She has been treated under multiple uh, medication, including antibiotics, antihistamine, nasal spray, without really, you know, with, without any good success. I went on, but then I started getting infections, and I was on antibiotics for four months in a row. They kept giving me, so I was like, this is not good. So uh, when we uh, examined uh, Miss uh, Janice Martinez, we found that her um, the natural sinus drainage pathway, it's obstructed by chronic inflammation, chronic infection. So we offer her the option of doing balloon sinuplasty. The best part was that the breathing. I could breathe again. Uh, the headaches, is little by little started going away. Now when I sleep, uh, I would breathe real loud. My husband will always say that, and I don't do that no more. So when you have a chronic sinus disease, that passage, it's obstructed. It's narrow by chronic inflammation, chronic infection. So what we do is we put a small balloon in the passage, and we open up, you inflate the balloon, and open up the natural passage, preserving the uh, normal anatomy. And I don't sound like I'm, I have cold all the time before I was like sick all the time and now I'm doing great I could go out do everything and I feel good one of the advantage is the quick recovery uh, there's really no downtime to uh, balloon sinuplasty the procedure can be done in office uh, under local anesthesia or the topical anesthesia with you know some nasal spray there's not really a recovery time for balloon. The patient can, you know, go back to her daily activity the next day and uh, compared to a traditional uh, surgery, which the recovery can last to uh, a week. Depression is a very common and a very bad disease. It's different than sadness. Sadness is what happens when you go through bad times in life and it just tends to come and go in, in all of our lives. Depression is an abnormality of the chemicals in the brain that brings on a lot of bad symptoms and often needs treatment with medications. The two main questions you should ask yourself to decide if you're depressed are these. Number one, have I felt hopeless and sad for most of the time in the past two or three months? And number two, have I lost my interest in those things that I usually get a charge out of doing? For example, ball games with the kids, movies, certain meals, certain things on TV. If you've lost your joy in life, that's a sign of depression and it needs to be treated. What can you do about depression if you have it? Well, you can do a lot. You could take medication. There's a lot of medications that work, most with few side effects. Exercise helps, getting adequate sleep, and counseling also helps. So, there's a lot of ways to go from sad to glad.
Uh, Graham was swimming in a banana boat with uh, two other people. Uh, two of them fell off the banana boat and Graham sustained a fracture of his cheekbone when someone's knee struck him in the cheek. He immediately could tell that something was the matter and luckily he's an orthopedic surgeon so he pulled me out, felt my, my cheekbone and he's like, you have a broken zygomatic complex. I'm like, okay. So I really don't know what a broken zygomatic complex means but I know that it doesn't feel right and when I put my hand on my cheek there's no cheekbone anymore. If, if I got it taken care of within seven days, then it shouldn't be an issue of where I got it taken care of. And he recommended that instead of getting it taken care of out in the middle of nowhere, three hours north of Atlanta on the weekend, that maybe I should wait to come to Houston and you know find a doctor who's you know good and make sure they'll have more time. It's not that pressing. Uh, he saw me with a depressed cheekbone, uh, some double vision, and numbness of the cheek, and there, there was a you know palpable and visible deformity. Um, he had a, a significant number of injuries and fractures and he had no support to the floor of his orbit. So with time, if that's not corrected, the eyeball will drop, he'll have increased double vision, and he will have continued numbness of the cheek. Now the fracture goes was right through the opening. There's a, a foramen or opening in the cheekbone where the nerve uh, supplies sensation to the teeth and the upper lip and the cheek, uh, and the fracture went right through that area. Often by reducing the fracture and, and placing the bones where they ought to be, there's less compression on the nerve and the nerve regenerates and uh, there's nearly normal sensation afterwards. But that's about the only residual that he has really right now. So apparently if I caught the knee a little bit closer to my nose, I could have died. <laughs> and if I didn't get the surgery, then I probably wouldn't have an eye because there's, since there's no bone holding it in place, it would have just sunk into my face and that would have caused a whole bunch of damage to the eye to the point where I couldn't use it. So I think having a second eye is pretty, pretty awesome. I like that, and um, the fact that you really can't tell is is pretty unexpected bonus for, for me. I was kind of thinking, oh, cool, I'm gonna look like you know some weird, gruesome Frankenstein Quasimodo type situation, and you really can't tell the difference. If you've had a doctor help change your life, we'd love to hear about it. Send us an email at info at bestdocsnetwork.com. I was unable to eat. I wouldn't travel with my husband because I was afraid. What if something in my mouth broke and I was overseas? What would I do? Five dentists told me I was an impossible case. She had uh, severe atrophy, we call it, of the upper jaw from uh, wearing the prosthesis for so long. And she had uh, m multiple missing lower teeth. My mouth never felt clean. I had no confidence. Um, I wouldn't get, get around a lot of people and I have a big personality and that upset me because I couldn't get around a lot of people. And so what we talked to her about was reconstruction of the entire uh, upper and lower uh, jaw and, and we also did uh, bilateral or both sides uh, sinus grafting. What this, uh, it's a sinus elevation procedure where we lift up the, the uh, membrane that's in the sinus, we put synthetic uh, bone in that, in that uh, uh, area and uh, allow that to solidify, then we can come back with implants and have a, much, uh, have a, a good base for the implants to fuse to the, the synthetic and host bone. It sounds horrible because the surgery, it looks scary. Compared to the pain that you've gone through not having teeth, it was no big deal. In this world, maybe nothing is permanent, but in our view, um, if the implants are placed properly, if they're restored properly, and they are maintained properly, they should last the patient indefinitely. I'm more healthier now. I'm not eating pizza and french fries and bread and cinnamon rolls. I'm eating fruit and carrots and all the vegetables. I just can't believe I've, and my taste, my, my mouth feels clean all the time. We're uh, interested in, in restoring patients' self-confidence uh, and also their quality of life. And uh, so we're interested in both the uh, how it looks and how it works and how it functions. When he did the surgery, I felt like I'd known him for a hundred years. He was just that awesome. And he very he doesn't tell you anything that he doesn't believe. It's very it's very emotional for me because I never dreamed I'd be able to have this done. 
All right, don't forget the Best Docs Network is here to help you find a doctor that meets your needs. And if you want to find out more information on any of the doctors you see on today's show, head to the website, bestdocsnetwork.com. That's right, and now it's time to head to our next best doctor, gynecologist, Dr. Marie Sleedman. Probably for the better part of 10 years, when I would call for sneeze, I would release urine. The leaky bladder is extremely common. And I think one of the biggest issues is that women just don't like to talk about it. They think they have to put up with it or they're somewhat reluctant to talk about it in the office to, to their doctor. It finally got to the point where it, it was interfering with stuff. I had to carry extra underwear and clothes to work or I'd have to go home in the middle of the day and it was, it was I don't think anyone ever noticed, but I felt embarrassed and uncomfortable, and that was what finally made me decide to get tested to see if my problem was due to um, the incontinence that this would fix. The procedure now is also a minimally invasive procedure, and it involves placing a small piece of mesh underneath the urethra, that's the tube that goes from the bladder to, to the outside, and it, it forms just a hammock or sling underneath the urethra. And when placed correctly, it, uh, it has an over 90% chance of success. After I had it done, I told Dr. Liebman, I wish I had done this five years ago because it, it made that much of a difference. And, but I thought I was too young. And so I convinced myself, oh, this, you don't have this, it's something else. This isn't gonna fix your problem. And so I just didn't ever talk to him about it. So I should have talked to him sooner. The recovery is, is also just wonderful. It's done as an outpatient. This procedure is still done as an outpatient in an in a, uh, outpatient facility or freestanding outpatient clinic. And uh, the patient will go home again, have something to eat, maybe take some pain medicine, but very little discomfort associated with it. I sneezed nothing, not a single drop. And that's, it's been two years now. I mean, it's completely changed my life very little discomfort associated with it. And what's really nice about it is that it's effective immediately. If it's going to work, it's, he'll tell you the next day she hasn't leaked, uh, much to her surprise. Officer Wayne Schultz weighed an unhealthy 554 pounds until he met Dr. Robert Marvin. To find out more on Wayne's story and other life-changing stories, log on to bestdocsnetwork.com. Many present in my office uh, complaining of a painful bunion deformity. A bunion deformity is that deviation of the great toe uh, where you see that bump on the side or bump on the top. Uh, it has to do with a deviation of the uh, first metatarsal and basically, you know, it just became really painful for her to walk in her regular shoes. Yes, because I really had this bunion, I think like probably about a year. And so it had got so bad, I couldn't even wear a shoe. So that's what really made me came in, you know, to have surgery on it. The next step was for us to take an x-ray and to evaluate her foot and determine what kind of, you know, surgery would be appropriate. So after looking at an intermittent tarsal angle, uh, we basically decided that an Austin bunionectomy would be the best procedure. Uh, and so that's what we ended up doing. After I had the surgery, I, I felt much better. You know, no pain, you know, it just felt better and I was so happy, you know, to get it done. I mean, as long as you address the underlying etiology, the, the cause of it, then you're not gonna get a recurrence, and uh, it's wonderful. I mean, you know, people suffer from painful bunions all the time. It can be painful to the point that you can actually develop an ulcer at the side bump, because first it gets red, and next thing you know, you have a wound. And uh, that can be problematic because then you can get an infection to the bone. I mean, it's not sore or nothing. It just feel better. And so he really do a good job and he makes me feel comfortable. I mean, he, he's a real good doctor. Bunion surgery has a bad knock to it. You know, a lot of people are concerned that you know, they've heard from you know, their neighbor or they know someone at work who's had the surgery and it's extremely painful. I have some patients that have zero pain from the bunion surgery, but I can keep the area numb for three days with a pain pump, which is a device that just gives continuous drip of local anesthetic and keeps it nice and numb. Because really, 
Inflammation is the first part of wound healing, and that's in the first 72 hours, so the first three days. It's, it's a great relief for patients. Really, two weeks of just not putting weight on it, uh, and you know, it, it's we've really come a long way with our surgeries. To be a comprehensive breast center it doesn't mean having a nice building and a, na a nice name on the, on the center. There's a lot of people that have done that. What makes you a comprehensive breast center is working with other physician specialties together to do the best that you can possibly do for each patient. It's important that when we find an abnormality that the radiologist understands the pathology, knows what to biopsy, when to biopsy and then can communicate that back to the referring physician, communicate it to the patient, and communicate to the pathologist what our concerns are. This is what the beauty is of a comprehensive breast center. So it really means working together as a team, working with your breast surgeons, working, working with the pathologist, working with the radiation oncologist, the plastic surgeons, and we work as a team. When people come to Topps Comprehensive Breast Center, or if they come to one of our Memorial Hermann Breast Centers, what they'll see is a group of dedicated breast radiologists. So when they come to one of our centers, they're dealing with a radiologist who is focused on finding cancer at the early stage. And one of the things that we talk about as a group, we want to disrupt as few lives as possible while finding cancers at the earliest stage. That's our mission statement. If someone comes in and we have a finding on the mammogram or they come in with a palpable lump and they need an ultrasound. In many facilities, this is performed by a technologist. The doctor may or may not ever see the patient. If they do see the patient, they only look at the area of interest. It is our policy and our practice that radiologist comes in on every patient. We scan every patient ourselves. We, yes, our technologists look, but we scan every patient. My strong belief is, and I think statistics prove, prove that, is that when you have specialists doing this, you get a better result. In our practice, that's what we do. That's the whole focus of our practice. You know, it's a very special group of people from all over the country, from very well-trained facilities, and uh, uh, so it's an exciting group to be part of. 12-year-old Kyle loves to play baseball, but it was hard to do due to allergies. That is until he met Dr. Lynn Dickens. To find out more about Kyle's story and other life-changing stories, log on to BestDocsNetwork.com. My name is Rashid M. Rashid. I have an MD and a PhD. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Went on to medical school at Loyola University. I did a, a combined degree program. I did um, an MD and a PhD at the same time. So it took me seven years. Uh, normally, if I had done them separately, it would have been a 10-year program. Um, I've always had a very strong interest in research. Um, I really like to understand where the, where the information we use comes from, why we use the information we use, and why things are happening. Uh, you know, I, I trained at MD Anderson, so when I did my training there, I had the opportunity to do rotations in clinics around the country, including at UCSF and other clinics that specialize in hair loss. Uh, so it always fascinated me to be in this area where few people were in and where it really matters to people, it really matters to people that they're losing their hair. And yet we have um, over um, almost 70 peer-reviewed papers all in, in, in journals that uh, have very strict uh, criteria for publications, um, including national journals uh, like academy journals and, and our specialties uh, in dermatology and medicine, trauma uh, across the board. Um, our hair loss uh, papers mostly uh, focused on things like other peripheral associations with hair loss, like vitamin D deficiency. We have a paper that, that is um, often cited about vitamin D deficiency and hair loss. We do a regular daily um, auditing of the peer-reviewed research and we regularly review and examine what's out there. We consolidate that, we provide that in, in an updated blog we have online uh, and it basically summarizes all the main uh, n new research ideas that are coming into place or they're just being developed um, by scientists and physicians around the world. So our, our method is called the follicular unit extraction. Um, that's been around for a few years. It used to be done manually, hair by hair. It would take a long, long time. 
Now we have different devices and machines that have sped up the process, so we can do larger cases in less time, and the price is also more uh, you know, acceptable to people than it used to be. You would get more hairs, uh, get back to work, and a lot less downtime, and the healing is very, very quick. Are you having trouble sleeping? Do you wake up rested? Sleep is important. It's a time when we consolidate uh, memory, we resolve conflicts, and we rest those aching bones and muscles and help our mind get back to normal from the wear and tear of the day before. So what's the best way to get a good night's sleep? First of all, avoid caffeine after 5 or 6 p.m. in the evening. Avoid alcohol near bedtime. Although it may make you feel sleepy, you're not getting quality sleep when you drink alcohol and you're also not getting all those things about consolidating memory and resolving conflict when you drink alcohol to help you get relaxed to sleep. There's lots of medications for uh, helping you sleep. However, the prescription medicines are ones that should not be taken on a regular basis. They can become a little bit habit forming. Some of the best medications for being able to sleep are the antihistamines that you can buy over the counter. There's many brand names and they work in a wonderful way. Plus, you don't get addicted to them. So, have a good night's sleep. Don't snore too loud and exercise regularly. That'll help you sleep a lot better. If you've had a doctor help change your life, we'd love to hear about it. Send us an email at info at bestdocsnetwork.com. Every woman is, you know, a little bit different on one side than the other, but um, after I got pregnant and I had my daughter, I was breastfeeding her, and she would only take from one side, which was my left side. I guess because of that, it made that side so much smaller. Mandy came to us initially asking for breast augmentation, and uh, after doing an exam and taking photos, it became obvious that she had a really big discrepancy between her breasts. And after further questioning, she told us that you know, she had to wear two bras and was putting something on the other side to balance it out. And there was a large difference. And it was a confidence issue. Um, it was a clothes issue. It was being able to get into a wedding dress that fit issue. And so there was a lot more going on than just a simple breast augmentation. Probably an, an A cup, maybe a small B on the left side. And then on the right side, I was like a full C. And so there was a huge difference there. And I didn't feel comfortable looking at myself in the mirror. I couldn't find bras to fit. And I said, I'm, I mean, I'm here to make you happy. I'm going to take care of you, and we're going to do everything we can to make you happy. And she did indeed need a lift. We put in different size implants to account for the different sized uh, pre-existing breasts. The hospital staff was wonderful. He was wonderful. He made me feel completely comfortable. He explained to me, you know, exactly what we were going to do and what was going to happen. And, uh, it's not just about the size of the breast, but it's the confidence and the balance that she's no longer thinking that people are looking at her and noticing that she has a two sports bras on or noticing uh, when she goes out and is doing something that her breasts are uneven. You know, I'm getting married on Friday and I had, you know, there's healing and, you know, all this process you have to go through and I wanted to be completely healed. I wanted to have no pain, you know, and everything like that. So. That's why I chose to do it a few months in advance. You know, everybody has subtle differences, but some people have more than subtle differences, and that's where a procedure like this is perfect, where it can correct those differences uh, and, uh, and really help people have confidence uh, and self-esteem uh, to know that they are filling their clothing out that's designed uh, in a certain way. Well, Jim, that'll do it. That'll wrap up another edition of the Best Docs Network, featuring some of the best physicians in the Houston area that have helped change people's lives. For more information on any of the fine doctors that you've seen on today's show, or to find a doctor that best fits your needs, just head to our website at bestdocsnetwork.com. That's right, Candace. That is the place to go. Also, if you have a question or comment for us, or there's a doctor that has helped change your life, We'd love to hear from you. Send us an email at info at bestdocsnetwork.com. That's info at bestdocsnetwork.com. So long, everyone. We'll see you next week.